Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the Australian Biochar Technology and the Biochar Effect promo uh, webinar. Um, this is about the Ansby Pavilion, uh, a stand F36 uh, at Bio360 uh, Expo in Nantes, France, next Wednesday, uh, February 8 and 9, so Thursday 9 as well. Um, we welcome uh, everyone to the first of ANSPIG's webinar series for 2023, uh, coming to you from the Macedon Ranges in Victoria. And ANSPIG acknowledges the Dajawarung, Tungarung, and Wurundjeri Woolwurrung peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of this land and waterways. ANSPIG recognises their living cultures an ongoing connection to country and pays respect to the elders past, present and emerging. ANSBIG also acknowledges local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, people, residents of Macedon Ranges for their ongoing contribution to the diverse culture of this community. So please in the chat, if you'd like to put uh, what country you're from, um, that would be great and say hello in the chat. So this webinar, as mentioned, is in the lead up to our pavilion, uh, Stand 36, and our panel discussion on the Australian biochar industry 2030 roadmap to a new carbon economy at Bio360 Expo in Nantes next week. We are very uh, excited today to bring the sponsors of the ANSBY Pavilion, uh, who are Earth Systems with their char maker technology and the Green Man Biochar and Wood Vinegar brand. Rainbow Beta and their Echo 2 Sky Carbon to Earth technology, uh, Clean syn Syngas, Biochar and Wood Vinegar, Theta Group, Trailblazers in Green Hydrogen and Biochar, Waste Ecology, a new player in the game uh, with their organic carbonisation uh, system, and Optimal Group with their Capstone Micro Turbine, turbine Systems uh, converting by Charles Syngas into electricity. So this is uh, just some of Australia's most innovative biochar technology. Uh, the projects associated with them, uh, the biochar coming off these projects, the wood vinegar produced, and the biochar carbon removal credits or BCRCs associated with all of them. In some cases, there are emissions avoidance credits as well a double whammy incentive for the uptake of biochar. So we are also very pleased uh, to promote the proposed full length documentary by Tree Media, the same people that brought you ice on fire a few years ago, um, called The Biochar Effect. ANSPIC would like to assist Tree Media reach their fundraising goal to ensure that what we see as being a very powerful communication tool for biochar worldwide becomes a reality on your screens later this year or early next. The webinar uh, will run uh, for approximately an hour and a half and each present presenter will have 10 minutes uh, to showcase their business model. Um, we will have Matthew uh, from Tree Media, Matthew Smith from Tree Media up, up first. So he'll do his presentation and then we'll go to five uh, minutes uh, Q&A um, straight after him so that uh, Matthew can then uh, retire for the evening because it's quite late in New York. And then we'll go on to the uh, our sponsors uh, of the pavilion um, for another 20 or so um, Q&A, minutes Q&A. If you are in the audience, uh, please use the Q&A panel uh, to type your question and then we will answer them live or type the answer on the screen. Uh, the audience can also, as mentioned, let us know what country you are on and make comments in the chat. This webinar is also about uh, pre-booking an appointment with myself, our sponsors and Tree Media uh, uh, at Bio360 uh, through the business meetings portal. Um, and uh, that's on the, yeah, if you're actually coming to, uh, to buy a 360 that's on their website there 
<laughs> so I will go straight into introducing uh, uh, Matthew Smith from Tree Media. So Matthew, if you'd like to turn on your video and, and audio, and you can start sharing your screen if you wish. Uh, Matthew is a uh, producer, writer, and director at Tree Media, and he is uh, and is spearheading Tree Imagination and N2K, um, which is Need to Know platform. He has a background in design, marketing, and education. Uh, Matthew has turned his attention to creating stories through film that inspire change and support individual growth and social development. Matthew is currently producing Legion 44 and has produced Ice on Fire for HBO and The Arrow of Time, a feature documentary on Gorbachev. Prior, he produced We the People 2.0 and produced an ex and uh, executive produced Urban Roots, uh, urban, about urban farming in Detroit. Um, he also wrote, produced and directed Giving Birth and produced the Lexus series, driving fashion towards Amber Valletta. Matthew also co-wrote and produced the series Green World Rising with Leonardo DiCaprio. He is currently in the production uh, pre-production phase of raising sufficient funds to produce, write and direct The Biochar Effect, a full-length documentary film on Biochar's role in the great bio transition uh, to the new carbon economy. Matthew lives with his family in uh, Chatham, New York. So welcome, Matthew. Welcome, yeah. thanks. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to go first. Um, and um, what can I say? Um, there's a lot of incredible people, I guess, watching and, and listening in. And I have come to understand that the biochar community are full of incredible heroes and wonderful people. And in that way, in that sort of in that sense, I'm trying to make, and do I share my screen? Um, I'm trying to make yes, a film. I was inspired by all of you people here on the on the on the on Zoom because I realized there's a real amazing story emerging, but the story about everything everybody's doing is not being told as a comprehensive uh, sort of story. Um, and I was so inspired that I decided I ran back to my team and said, we have to make a film about biochar. And at first, I, I, people looked at me like, I don't know if that's enough for a film. <laughs> that's always the big question. And I said, well, I think it is. And I laid it out to them. And by the end of my presentation, everybody signed off and was excited. And I then created what we call a film deck that I'd like to share with you um, what I'm trying to do. And everything, and everything of course, is a work in progress that um, that can change very drastically because as a documentary filmmaker, you go and you, while you plan to go to all these different places and interview and ask all these different questions and, 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 and sort of take in what's out there, um, the story can change very drastically. And, but, but to make a film, you have to make a deck. It's like you give a presentation and I would like to share that with you. Um, and then I'll give you an opportunity to ask me questions. <clears throat> and uh, here it comes. All right, hold on, let me stop sharing. I don't know why this is not happening. Oh. I'm sorry, I had it all ready to go. Here we go. And I am now sharing my presentation. Here you go. All right. Backwards. 
So the film that I'm making is uh, called The Biochar Effect. Um, it is basically a film that looks at the larger story of the world's biotransition from what I consider the geo um, world. Everything has been based on fossil fuels, 200 years. Everything that we do today is, is influenced and based on fossil fuels. Can we move it to a, to a bio, um, to biofuels, to, to a, a bio, based world and get off of fossil fuels as much as we can. Um, we need to take care of our lands, our water, uh, and we need to mitigate climate change and eco-destruction. But I wanna make it a very practical film, very solution oriented. So why not start with Terra Preta and really make my audience understand, hopefully going to the Amazon, making my audience understand that there was a time where millions of people probably created um, deep trenches and, and large regions all the way up to 80 a hectare or 200 acres of fertilized so soil where they planted um, in the Amazon, which is known for its it's poor soil, uh, everything they needed and wanted. And they created this and you guys know all about this. So I'm, I'm going in with uh, Terra Preta and explaining that the world has already seen a time where soils have been ameliorized, valorized, and we can do this again. And so one big push in the, um, Film is really talking about healing agriculture. And I like to go into non-technical emotional aspects because film is something that needs to feed the soul, not just the mind. And I wanna talk about healing because I think if we can learn from our ancestors, we can do the same thing all over the world. We can learn, we have the understanding, we just need to know that it can be done. So I'm talking all about this, this aspect of biochar, which of course, terra preta is this biochar idea. Um, and there's of course many other ideas still in there that have that are being discovered um, that we can do this today. So we're going into biochar healing agriculture with biochar. Um, but we have a we have a lot to solve, a lot more to solve than the people 2.5, you know, two and a half thousand years ago or 2000 years ago, whenever they lived, um, people are still arguing about when it started. And But I'd say a long time ago, we have we have to take care of the sea, um, uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere, which we need to bring down, which is a big aspect of, of the CDR that biochar can provide. The beautiful thing is we can restore the earth's land with biochar and this idea of terra preta, but 75% is somehow broken or destroyed or stressed. We can fix that, I believe so. And I wanna show that with the film, we have a lot of polluted waters that we need to take care of. Can we do that? I think so. And then we have billions and billions of tons of waste, which in other words is also a form of biomass that is just sitting there rotting, emitting CO2 and a lot of hazardous materials are in it, poison, toxins. Can we take care of this? I think so. And then there's one aspect down the road when I talk about biochar in application of building materials and large materials like concrete, where I'm, I'm, I'm showing, and this is also something I've done in my previous films, where I'm showing how if a system is out of whack, everything is out of whack. And here's this illegal sand mining, and you know that there's a lot of illegal activities around resource um, uh, resources and biochar can take some of that stress away. Is biochar the silver bullet? I don't know. I'm very impressed by what I've seen. Um, I'm very impressed by what I see that people know and understand. And I want to 
bring this in the film and make a strong case for, for this. Um, can we take care of all these things? I think we can. Um, and, and, and that's the case I want to make. And this is a good friend of mine, Peter, Peter Wadhams. He says, if we can save civilization, why don't we do it? Exactly. And this is really where I don't want to make a message film, but I want to make a film with a strong impetus towards solutions and that they're out there, go and find them, join them, and let's let's turn this, this issue that we have around. Um, Biodrop closes the circularity loop. I'm talking about that by carbonizing, uh, drive sustainability and all this. So we're looking at a couple of things like, you know, waste of value. There's so much to, so much to tell. I'm going all around the world. Um, I'm definitely looking at scalability issues, um, taking biochar, stepping outside of the, the, the small farmer, um, you know, homemade kind of, you know, story that biochar is still in and moving it out into the industrial space where scalability um, where solutions, uh, where big questions have to be answered. And we know that around the world, a lot of them have been answered. There's been a lot of tests. I want to talk about that. I know in Australia is a lot of incredible stuff happening with biochar feeding it to, to animals. Um, uh, you know, there's just so many uh, different things, water treatments and filtration. Um, and then I want to talk quickly about cities what cities can do if they take it seriously circularity the waste of value this is a um yeah um and basically my acts are simple what goes up must come down so that's one of the jobs that biochar can take care of with all its siblings in the cdr space what is what made is is must be unmade is the idea of circularity and then this idea that also kathleen draper and um, uh, just slipped my mind, the other gentleman who wrote the book, Cooling the Earth with Fire, I think is a strong message um, that people like. They, they want to understand what that could be. How can you cool something with fire? Um, it's a little bit the playoff of the ice on fire that I came up with for our film, Ice on Fire. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Albert Bates and Kathleen yeah. Draper. Yeah. The distribution. What did you say? Albert Albert Bates and Kathleen Draper. Yeah. And, yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah. yeah. So, so the film is going to be distributed as wide as possible. Uh, we are building a channel um, that can hold it. We want to make the film accessible to a lot of different people, low entry all over the world. Um, that's why we, I'm funding it myself or I'm, I'm, I'm asking everybody to help me fund it. Uh, so we, we're not stuck on a platform like HBO. I want to make it wide so people in the biochar industry, people who are interested, can, can show it to their clients, their friends, and create sort of the biochar effect <laughs> of um, telling the story, a comprehensive stories. We've been all over the place. We've been a lot of festivals. We're a reputable company and authenticity is is one of our big things. We're we're trying to tell a story, an independent film. I'm not trying to make a biochar commercial. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about artistic ways of going in and out. But I'm going to show, of course, a lot of places and people that are in the industry, leading folks, leading ideas. And if I raise enough money, I even have some ideas for animation, which, as you know, always enhances certain visual processes that you cannot show in real life. Um, I, I don't want to pitch uh, the money here. I just want to tell you that this film is being made. Um, it has to be funded, um, but you, we can talk about this or you you can reach out to Don or or I'm going to be non too. Um, if you're interested in uh, providing content or financial assistance or as I say, sponsorship. Um, and I think that's for now a good start. I'm a little over my time, but um, that Thank gives you. everybody yeah. a good idea. Thanks so much, Matthew. It's um, yeah, very exciting.
um, and we wish you all the best with that. And if you've got any questions for Matthew, please put them in the um, in the panel uh, Q and I think we've got one question coming through. We must also mention at this stage that um, Rainbow Bee Eater um, have uh, contributed to your film, back to your yes. film. Uh, so that's that's really wonderful. They've got the ball rolling. So yeah, it would be great to see you get over the line. And uh, I understand you have got a lot of interest in Europe. Uh, I do have a lot of interest. I, I do want to thank Peter and um, yeah, and yeah. I, I want to the rainbow bee eaters yeah. um yeah. for yeah, yeah because it okay. was it yeah. critical yeah peter would yeah. you peter would you like to say anything at this point about about why you backed the the film you can you don't have to it's not compulsory no no let me come in look can i my camera's off um yeah. put your camera on if you can turn your camera off no i think you have to it's um, telling me i can't is it maybe Sam has to? Oh, um, yeah, we're there. Yeah, okay. Over there. Okay. Yep. So, so I'm sitting in Optimal's um, headquarters too. You'll notice. You'll notice there's a hydrogen fueled capstone micro turbine behind me. So another part of the biochar story. So Optimal are, are the engineers that we're working with at the moment. Um, we, for us, the biochar story is complex to tell. Um, and everyone that's part of Ansbeg and probably most of the people who are on this call now know how difficult it is when you're sitting at a party or at a bar or something and someone says, well, what do you do? And you start to talk about biochar. And it's, and it's not, I, I've been attempting to do it well for 15 years and I don't think I, I still think I don't do it very well. So when Matthew came along with this idea and with his pedigree, um, we just embraced it. So I hope others do. Um, we'll certainly do everything we can to assist Matthew to get this up. That's all. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. So we've got a few questions in the audience. Um, so uh, from Scott Fairburn, uh, Fairburn from Cedar Group, uh, one of our sponsors. So hi, Scott. Uh, what is the key impact you believe a documentary like this will raise questions for global governments, industrial entities, private sector entities, as to consider as part of future investment piece or behavioural decisions by utilising biochar? Well, I think, this, I think the story has to, the, 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 the job that I see, the, the complexity that I, I see uh, that lies ahead of me is to take these, these satellites that are floating um, by themselves and bind them together to a molecule that a visual molecule where everybody understands what I mean by the biochar effect because the production of biochar is one thing but the waste streams going into this and what can be done that meliorization or the effect that biochar can have on all these aspects are so drastically phenomenal that simply by and that was my experience by looking at it, most people say, this cannot be, there's something not right. And I wanna say, let's not do a rework history, but it is right. And I have to tell that story and make everybody say it is right. If I can tell that story, when I can tell that story and when it is out, people will go watch the film and get it and will be activated to do something about that. And especially all the representation that is now here and everybody that's, that's gonna be also coming to the conference, they are supposed to take that film and tell their folks, let's get moving, you know? I mean, if Terra Preta has been done over 10, and I'm using that on purpose, over you know thousands of years ago in the Amazon, why can't we do it with all the technology and knowledge and power that we have? It's possible. Um, and, and that, that's what drives me to make this film. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's you. Um, great. Uh, this is Frank Stree from Terra Prada Developments in Tasmania. Uh, so he's down under, down under, basically. So great concept outline. Good that you mentioned Kathleen and Albert and their great read about pyrogenic carbon. 
Uh, I'd, I'd like to know uh, if you have already been aware of Pro Silver uh, Holistic uh, Forestry uh, equals regenerative and restorative and renovative practices in 27 countries, especially Pro Silver uh, Slovenia, uh, Tane's Tree Trust in New Zealand, and Pure Advantage in New Zealand. So, yeah, are you aware of the, the Pro Silver? I'm not aware forestry. of particular, so I'm a, I'm a newbie in the space and I, I move from suggestion to suggestion. I'm meeting a lot of amazing people and it's beautiful. And, and now what I like is the ecological sort of tying in the, 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 you know, the classic, you know, the classic climate change concerned person, the, the farmer, they're, they're all coming together in this, in, in this namesake. And it's, that's what, what I like. And that's, I think what's the powerful message that there's not you know, we're all all the people that are concerned about the planet and our own personal health and the generations to come, that they are going to be sitting together, working together and agreeing very quickly because this is such an agreeable uh, a subject. I don't know if it has anything to do with silver pasture. I've, I'm very familiar with all the um, agricultural yeah. practices and yeah. and yeah, so so but but please uh, introduce yeah. yourself. Yeah me in Nantes or send me an email. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Yeah, it, obviously the uh, IPC, it, it, when they uh, describe biochar as a, as a negative emissions technology, it's also together with pyrogenic carbon capture and storage. Um, yeah. so, so photosynthesis, you know, storing that carbon. And of course, yeah. um, we, we should do that in a sustainable manner. Um, you know, it, it, so the uh, agroforestry, combining forestry with animals and all that sort of thing, pro-silver agriculture, as far as I understand it, Frank, um, that's what that's all about. Well, you know, I, I, I understand that the Sahara was once a fertile land. Why don't we show the human ingenuity and will to maybe help the Sahara go back to some parts of fertile land rather than just reducing yeah. the Amazon? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so reducing so the yeah, yeah. yeah reducing the desertification of the yes. planet. Yeah. Um, Elliot Stewart, uh, Matthew, will you include any context on biosolids to biochar from the water sector as a big win-win opportunity? Um, great yes, message. Um, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So so I have. I mean, sorry, were you done with the question? Oh, no, he's just made a comment here. I think it is great message about circular economy and management of PFAS slash microplastic. Yeah, um, so 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 I do want to show very clearly the 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 question of the biosolids to 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 biochar as a step before um, um, biosolids are you know, reused in, you know, biochar, meaning we made a film called We the People 2.0, which basically discovered that they just did the biosolids and they sprayed it on the orchard and poisoned kids that were playing there. And some of them even died because all the pharmaceuticals, all the stuff that's still in there. Biochar, the pyrolysis process can take care of that. And it must be an absolutely must be an industrial standard that everybody does. I believe that at this point, but I have to be careful because I'm a filmmaker and not, I'm not as smart in the process of biochar to be to 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 speak so strongly. But as an enthusiast, I think that's where biochar can shine. The pyrolysis process can shine in taking really taking down the waste. Okay. Um, um, yes. Yeah. Great. I want to get into that. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, activity happening in Australia in the wastewater sector. We, I think we've got... Fantastic. About, and yeah. the filtration is a big one that I want to show. Anybody has a strong, powerful filtration visual uh, with rice husk, biochar, or whatever, I'd love to film it and come and talk. Great. All right. Wonderful. Um, last question. Would you consider a startup model cottage industry production unit as part of your doco? So this is like the, uh, you know, mobile pyrolysis, smaller scale. I know, um, you know, particularly in those uh, uh, areas of in tropical uh, agriculture, 
uh, you know, they're looking at a carbon credit scheme where these small farmers can come together and collectively um, claim carbon credits. So are you going to do anything on that sort of smaller scale mobile mobile uh, technology, you know, out in the field? Um, I, I was made aware of the, you know, the, the, the biochar, I keep forgetting the name. I want to say Contiki. What's it, what's yeah. it called? The Contiki. You know, yeah. Hans-Peter Schmidt, my, you know, my, yeah. yeah. So he, he did all this and, yeah. and I do want to, be, I asked him, should I bring this in? And he says, well, it's, it's become the large, largest spread. It's actually the biggest biochar producer by, by scale. Um, right now, when you take all of them together, so I definitely want to. I definitely want, one of the aspects that, that is also important for us as a as a film company is that we always look to get away from the monopoly into local sustainable activities. Um, and and one beautiful thing about biochar is is that is it is that. So the city um, wants to get rid of its waste. Um, there's a biochar machine there. They don't have to ship it 200 miles to somebody else and give the problem to somebody else. We can take, people should take care of their trash um, and, and biochar gives is, is one of these solutions and they should take it and then they, they, they should take care of both sides, you know, both sides of the process. Yeah, right, all right. Uh, we'll wrap it up there, Matthew. So once again, thank you so much for uh, participating today. And uh, as mentioned, people can pre-book an appointment with you Please. through the Bio360 Expo website um, or type it in the chat um, or get in touch with, with Anspe. And uh, uh, Matthew, I've just put more information there regarding ProSilver. So you might, you could click on those couple of links uh, there. Fantastic. So um, yeah, well, uh, if you want to hang around, you're very welcome, but if you need to go. <laughs> Thanks for giving. Um, yeah. Thanks for giving me the chance, and and everybody, keep going. It's amazing. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. So, okay, um, we'll move on to our our next speaker now, which is uh, Nigel Murphy, and uh, Nigel is not only the chair of Antvig, uh, but he's also the co-founding director uh, of uh, Earth Systems uh, in Port Melbourne, and uh, so. Uh, yeah, he's uh, and and as well as uh, Earth System Cyclic Carbon. So they're companies that have been actively innovating and commercialising technology in the clean clean tech sector over the past twenty five years, including biochar. Uh, his biochar experience covers product development, IP protection, capital raising, commercialisation, and market development. He has degrees in environmental and earth sciences and experience working in Australia, China, Southeast Asia, Africa, and the Pacific. He has provided technical advice to companies, government, financial institutions, and the aid sector in environmental science, clean tech, and environmental management. He is an honorary life member of the Environment Institute of Australia and New Zealand and was the foundation chair of the certified Environmental Practitioner Scheme for Australia and New Zealand. He is also the current chair of the Victorian Clean Tech Cluster. Um, welcome, Nigel. Uh, over to you to uh, share your slides. Thanks very much, Don. And uh, um, that's a very long introduction. And, and uh, um, but look, I'd, I'd firstly like to say just um, uh, Matthew, that was great to hear about your work with the biochar effect. I think it's well needed in the biochar sector. We need to get our message out there um, to, to the community, to governments. Uh, I think we've got a great story to tell. We probably need uh, a great storyteller. So um, great, great that you're uh, involved, Matthew. And um, yeah, look, uh, Earth Systems is really excited to be part of the delegation, the ANSBIG delegation to NOT, to Bio360, um, showing the work that, um, um, the good good work that uh, a number of organisations are doing in the biochar bio sector here in Australia and New Zealand. Um, today, I'd just like to, to give you a little bit of an introdu introduction to Earth Systems and some of the 
the work we've been doing uh, in biochar and, and um, what we'll, we will be doing moving forward. Um, Earth Systems has always been a company that has focused globally. Uh, environmental problems are, are global problems. Um, if we're going to fix climate change, uh, it's something we 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 need to do as a as a global community. So we're interested in uh, taking biochar to the world, scaling scaling up what we do uh, globally. Um, if you look at Earth Systems, we're 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 virtually a thirty year thirty year anniversary this year. Uh, our vision has been to use innovation and science to repair the earth. As Matthew said, you know, there's large areas that have been uh, overutilized or poorly, poorly, uh, poorly managed by uh, by humans. And uh, honestly, it's to our detriment. So the more sustainable we can make uh, our use of the planet, it's going to uh, benefit the people that inhabit it. Um, Earth Systems is predominantly scientists and engineers. Um, and we have offices in uh, uh, in Melbourne, uh, and also we have offices in we have an office in Bristol in the UK, Shanghai in China, uh, Laos, PDR. We've had an office there for over twenty years. Vietnam, Senegal, and Rwanda in Africa, and we've worked extensively uh, across the globe. Um, you know, in, in Asia and Africa, uh, 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 we do a, a lot of work and we're pretty agnostic, you know, in terms of um, who, who, who we work with. Um, we believe that uh, we need the private sector, government, research, international development and capital to solve some of the the. Uh, sustainability issues that we currently face. So we've spent, you know, almost 30 years building intellectual property experience, global networks, and know-how to deliver outcomes can improve Earth assets. That's one thing developing a technology. It's another thing getting it applied and getting it used and making it commercial and getting uptake. Uh, so we've learned that along the way that you know, there's a number of pieces that need to be put together to create successful outcomes. And we've invested heavily in in, in uh, biochar for, for well over 15 years. And uh, probably in the last few years, it started to become a growing part of our company. So some of the companies that we've worked, worked with, yeah, just a, a bit of an overview, uh, large and small water authorities, government bodies, private sector companies, uh, a range of organisations that we've worked work with, probably increasingly, you know, finance organisations looking at finance for development are becoming an increasingly um, important in, uh, in creating sustain sustainability outcomes. Uh, more and more projects are um, their finance is subject to to meeting environmental and social considerations, including climate change considerations. So, this is an exciting opportunity, and will we'll no doubt, I think, have quite a significant uh, impact on on, um, on on biochar and its use in the future. Uh, journey, our biochar journey really started trying to find a solution to paddock burning of wasted biomass in Australia. Because we're a pretty warm climate, a lot of biomass just gets wasted and, and gets gets burnt. Um, putting the uh, carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. Um, we really got a bit of momentum when we received a Victorian government grant uh, to, uh, to develop a technology to transform large waste biomass, so um, biomass that's not chipped or, you know, logs and stumps into a useful carbon product. And we invested, you know, significant research and development dollars ourselves. Uh, and in the early days, there was no one interested in inv investing in, in biochar or the, 
the technology development. So it was really our own funds, um, complement, complemented with some partners that um, really um, financed our uh, development of our, firstly, our batch char maker for processing woody logs and branches. And then we developed our continuous char maker for a chip feedstock rice husks and, and um, you know, biosolids and, and things like that. So we've uh, commissioned and installed our char makers in not only in Australia, but we're, we've put char makers into Hong Kong, Sweden uh, and Israel and, and uh, building one for New Zealand. And we also decided to launch our Green Man brand to sell biochar and wood vinegar. Uh, in Australia, because everybody said, well, where's the market for biochar? Well, one way of finding the market is to, to try and sell the product yourself. And uh, that's what we did. And, uh, you know, that's really been uh, a great sort of learning experience for us. And we're still on the early stages of that Green Man uh, brand journey. So, you know, how do we process our, our our products pretty much uh, it's probably pretty standard throughout the industry but you know biomass in we have our uh, slow slow pyrolysis system in our in our char maker we generate biochar um, you know which is a uh, really a very special carbon product and its uses are not just agricultural uses it's also got huge potential for replacing fossil fuel carbon uh, in a range of applications. Wood vinegar or pyroligneous acid is, is another product that we make, um, developed our own systems for, uh, for extraction of the pyroligneous acid. Again, a very valuable product that's for finding uh, a lot of niche uses. And then there's also... Um, because it's a, an energy generating process, there's also heat and electricity that can be generated. And excitingly uh, and increasingly, um, carbon dioxide credits uh, can be generated. Um, if the biochar is used for particular applications and if the process is uh, meets certain standards and requirements. So, you know our batch char makers. <clears throat> so we've we've uh, we've got two batch char makers recently installed in uh, in Sweden. One for a, a local council um, dealing uh, pretty much with um, uh, their their wood stumps. They uh, had a um, difficult to uh, to landfill. Um, they were trying to keep their their wood stumps out of landfill and difficult to find uh, um, the right way of, of um, extracting the value from, from that woody biomass. So they put in a, a char maker and now producing significant biochar, which is uh, used, um, you know, by, um, by the, uh, the city council for, for applications um, in their um, city environments. And also, we've put in recently uh, put in a uh, a batch char maker in uh, northern Sweden for a uh, construction company. Uh, again, looking at at putting biomass waste and producing biochar and and energy um, for their operations. And uh, really, they're looking at at doing it right across. Um, uh, right across their operations in uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Um, we've also our continuous char maker, which is uh, uh, our standard unit is 500 kilo kilograms per hour, and it's uh, can take uh, wood chips, it can take rice husks, it can take anything that has a uh, calorific value and also uh, a regular uh, size component. And uh, we've installed um, our uh, continuous char maker 
uh, in uh, Australia and, of course, in Hong Kong um, and uh, Israel. Um, and uh, we're in the process of setting, setting, uh, setting up a machine, a two tonne per hour machine in Hong Kong. And uh, the bottom photo to the right there shows that uh, machine um, uh, or one of the machines being installed. We're also establishing a demonstration site at Yarra Rangers with the support of Yarra Rangers Council in Melbourne, which we will uh, operate in, uh, in 2023. So where are we heading? Well, scale up. Scale up is, the, is what we've got to do. We've got to turn our industry from a, a cottage industry into a global important industry. And, you know, if we, if we do get uh, take up on biochar, then uh, companies and organisations like us need to need to st step up to the plate. And so we're scaling up our technology production facilities and capabilities. We're continuing to, to grow our technology and IP portfolio, um, you know, continuous improvement. We're, we're, we're still learning, learning a lot. Um, we need to make sure we're establishing attractive biochar business models for biomass producers or collectors. It's not enough to develop a technology. It's got to, it's got to be commercial. It's got to be safe and it's got to be commercial. Um, there's plenty of opportunity to take the biochar opportunity globally. Uh, different different uh, jurisdictions have, have different issues, but um, there's plenty of uh, biomass that could be better used uh, almost everywhere. Um, we're also looking at the niche applications for biochar. As, as I said, it's a specialty carbon product. If you look, to, look at activated carbon or carbon black, they're products that have been with us for, you know, 100 years. And there's hundreds of applications for those, those products. They're multi-billion dollar industries. And Biochar will be the same. Not all biochars are, are, are they have different feed, they come from different feedstocks, they're processed in, in different ways, but we need to be able to create consistent biochar products that can be used for different applications like animal feed or or for um, water, water quality management or for uh, broad scale agriculture or horticulture. Earth Systems wants to grow our Green Man biochar brand, and we'll, we will produce our our um, our own biochar. I mean, how can you how can you build a bridge if uh, you know how can you tell someone how to build a bridge if you if you can't build a bridge ourselves? So part of our experience is being hands on and uh, doing it ourselves and making sure that we're uh, continu continuously learning. The uh, um, biochar is uh, is also becoming a um, a great uh, source of carbon carbon credits, drawdown carbon credits being recognised, and this is a, also an opportunity for us to be a, a trusted source of uh, biochar drawdown carbon credits. And we all need to contri contribute um, uh, in a collaborative way to the growth of our our sector. We have to grow the the, the biochar, biochar cake, and um, we have to do that. Uh, we have to collaborate together to uh, to make that happen. And if we do that, we'll all benefit. So Anne's big plays a key key role in that. I'm just sort of mindful of time. Don't want to go uh, over time, but um, it's important. The inertia is starting to. Uh, um, we're starting to turn the momentum in our favour. Um, certainly, there's a lot more interest and support for biochar. There's some reasons why, you know, there's been the inertia, but uh, what we have to do is just focus on making sure we're, we're uh, producing quality biochar, um, where uh, we've got good systems and processes within the industry that gives uh, community and government confidence in what we're doing. So certainly the, the um, 
code of practice, the ANSB code of practice and certification are very important. So Earth Systems is there to, to help with uh, biochar dreams. We're, we're uh, a producer of technology, but we're also uh, knowledgeable in, in uh, you know, from a science and engineering perspective on the, on the application and, and use of biochar. So uh, please reach out if, if you think we can be of help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. Yeah, that, that's great, yes. And 2023, I think, will be our year of, uh, or the theme, good theme for 2023 could be substance. So the uh, biochar carbon removal credits are five times in demand of biochar itself at the moment. And uh, so markets in Australia are not as mature as the US or Europe yet. and uh, so actually doing it, actually producing the char yourself, Nigel, um, yeah, is, is the, probably the best way to mature these markets in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, I can vouch that the Green Man Biochar and Wood Vinegar is a very, very good product, high quality product. So thanks, Nigel. And we'll move on to uh, our next speaker, which is Peter Burgess. Um, Peter, you can turn on your uh, settings now and you can share the screen, screen if you'd like but Peter is our vice chair at ANSPIC and he's manage, managing director at Rainbow Beta. He trained as a metallurgic engineer and held senior operational corporate and advisory roles with several large Australian and international mining and manufacturing projects including Alcoa in Western Australia, Victoria and USA. Served as chair of the federal government and industry light metals Action Agenda. He's on the Board of Engineers uh, Without Borders Australia and as consultant to Illumina, Illumina Limited and CSIRO uh, Minerals Energy. So welcome, Peter. I will uh, hand over to you. Thanks, John. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. And see me? Is the camera on? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so, yep. Yep, so Sam's going to run the slides. So, so Don, I'm I'm sitting in the headquarters of Optimal Group, and um, so I'll I'll speak about Rainbow Beta, and I'll also speak about Optimal Group, um, who is the engineering group that, that is also coming with us to Nantes. Um, so, I, I can do I can do that at the end of this, or you can tell me to do it at the end of the session. But I'll sure. I'll be Craig Dugan as well. Okay, yep. sure. Okay, thank you. Do you be Craig Dugan straight, you know, straight after yours? Okay, sure. So, so Rainbow Beat has been around since 2007 when Ian Stanley and I got interested in converting biomass residues into biochar to put in the ground as a way of burying atmospheric CO2. And ever since we started, it was always about burying atmospheric CO2 as, as biochar. And the only way we believed that that was going to all work out at large scale was for the the syngas that, that, that can be produced through pyrolysis was a clean syngas that could be used economically as a fuel, as a replacement to natural gas or LPG or other fossil fuels. So, that, so that's the track we've been on since 2007. The, our, the target markets that we've pursued are broad acre agriculture. And um, we believe that, and, and are aiming for the biochar and the wood vinegar to be low cost so that very affordable for farmers to use um, to, to put into broad acre and horticulture. That's, that, that's been a, a single-minded purpose since we started. And the, re the reason we're going to Bio360 and not, um, we, were, we were invited to the 2020 conference and Ian and I went to that. Why were we, in, why were we invited? Because the organiser of Bio360, uh, Paul Stewart, recognised the link between low cost fuel gas that could replace natural gas and so on and biochar and also the ability to draw down carbon. So he saw that three or four years ago. Um, we, we first met at, at the same time that I met Puro. Puro were just in the process of setting up the, the, the core process, the carbon removal certification process that I think most people are aware of. 
So for us, this has always been a journey about turning CO2 into biochar that's low cost and high quality, of course, that, and the low cost biochar can go into the soil and a fuel gas that can be used to replace fossil fuels. And, and one of the outcomes of that is the certified carbon removal. We, the Rainbow Bead has been selling corks now since 2020 to companies like Microsoft, Shopify, Shopify, not Spotify, Don, uh, Shopify, um, some of the Northern Hemisphere banks, and, and, and we've been, we, we're typically sold out 12 months ahead. Um, next slide, please, Sam. So there won't be too much text in these slides. So the motivation has always been, how do we scale carbon removal fast? This has never been about developing a technology or developing a single project. It's always been about facilitating multiple high quality regional carbon removal. What are circular economies where local biomass is used to generate energy that's, that's useful locally? I'll come back to that. Um, and biochar that can be biochar and wood vinegar that can be used locally and, and at a very economic um, scale. Echo 2 is now proven. Um, it's commercial. It's Australian developed and owned and manufactured. Um, always has been and I hope always will be. The outputs, high quality, low cost biochar, sing gas, wood vinegar and carbon removal certificates. Let me just touch on this point about what are the ideal locations for this sort of system. At the moment, it's put the system alongside an energy user because syngas is not suitable for putting into a pipeline or uh, compressing and into a tanker and taking somewhere else. So at the moment, the best location is alongside an energy user. And certainly glass houses are, are, are perfect um, for us to sit alongside. The, our first project, Hollow Fresh, is a glass house. The second project, I'll show you much bigger, Katunga Fresh, um, is a glass house. And, and there the syngas will be used to displace fossil fuels for, for heat um, and CO2. Soon, so th this, is, this is one of the um, wonderful things about our partnership with Optimal, with Craig Dugan and his team at Optimal. Um, I'll, I'll intersperse this with my own presentation. So Optimal are a group of um, engineers out of the oil and gas industry, um, out of the aeronautical in industry. The company's existed for a bit over 10 years. And they're also the Australian and Pacific agent for the capstone micro turbines. So they, they've done hundreds of installations of the capstone micro turbines. They're very experienced in that space. And now they've got very interested in hydrogen as a, as a fuel for capstone turbines and also syngas um, directly without converting it to hydrogen. So, so that's, that's something that we see in the not too distant future, that the, that the Echo 2 syngas could be converted to hydrogen and, and used as a fuel for a micro turbine, or directly um, use the, the, the very clean syngas as a fuel for the micro turbine. The other fuel that is actually ahead of all that is dimethylethane. Um, this, with, with Optimal now and some of the very large global groups who I can't name, um, we're exploring that idea of converting syngas into dimethylethane. And dimethylethane is a drop in liquid fuel that can be used to replace any of the liquid fuels. Um, certainly LPG, it's easy for LPG. I understand it can replace diesel as well. Um, so that, that's on the near term horizon. And given that that can be proven out, then really the locations for ECHO2 type technologies, any of these technologies that make a clean syngas is basically anywhere there's biomass because the syngas can be converted into the DME or any other form of liquid fuel and then transported. Thanks, Sam. Th this is just a bit of a timeline. I don't know how well those photos show up, but it, it just shows the scale, the scale up. So the, the, the first on the left, you can see Ian Stanley's wheat farm in Western Australia and the size of the little prototype that we built back in um, 2014, 2015. And we, we'd call that today a quarter scale prototype. And then along came Holofresh, which is a one hectare glasshouse. And so that's a, that's a 
unit that's got a capacity a little bit under one tonne an hour of um, dry biomass, a little under one megawatt of syngas. And then in the middle of 2022, we signed a contract to supply six of the Holofresh st style units, go back, thanks Sam, um, to Katunga Fresh, which is a much larger glass house, 21 hectare glass house in northeastern Victoria. The, Australia's capacity, we, we've been, been involved in the roadmap um, discussions with Ansbig and CSIRO have just put out a paper that I think supports what I'm about to say. Australia's capacity for those sort of projects, um, whether it's sitting alongside an energy user or not sitting alongside an energy user, just inside a, a region where there's biomass and converting the same gas into um, drop-in liquid fuels is something like a hundred or a thousand times what we're talking about on that slide. So, so very large capacity. Thanks, Sam. That, that's a, an AutoCAD image of what we're building, um, six of for Katunga Fresh, and, and we'll put a new version into Polar Fresh over the next few months. The, the benefit of this technology, Rainbow Beta was never about developing technology, but we had to develop a technology to, to enable these, uh, these circular economies to, de to be developed. So this is modular. If we had to put 10 alongside each other, we would. Um, it is certified carbon removal. We've got a track record of that now. It does make a, a clean renewable gas. It's now got thousands of, thousands of hours of runtime and it's very, very cost effective. Thanks, Sam. This, this slide's a month old, but um, the, there's a photo, the photo there on the right hand side, you can see the, the part of the 21 hectare glass house of Katunga Fresh in the background and the steel sitting on the, the pad ready for the, the building that will house the, echo, the six Echo 2 modules. And yet the, the CAD image on the left, you can see the straw, the large square bales of straw um, on, on which this will be based. So that the region around Katunga is a grain growing area. Um, we'll be using a small percentage of the straw that's currently burnt to, to fuel this system. Peter Vandengore, the, the owner of Katunga Fresh is also a, a farmer, a grain farmer in his own right. He's got a couple of thousand hectares of farm around his farm and some or maybe all of the early biochar and wood vinegar will be used on his farm. The, the straw system, the, the shredding system, the, the automatic crane system that's on the left-hand side of the image there, that, that's starting to arrive from Denmark. We've, we've bought known technology from Denmark and all things going well, we'll be commissioning that in the middle of 2023. Thanks, Sam. Uh, that's, that's the last slide. So why, why are we going to, to Bio360? We were invited to go back again for the conference in a couple of weeks time. For us, we're very interested in exploring how we might contribute to what contribute to the carbon removal movement that's now becoming quite strong in Europe. We think we've got a, a good technology to enable that. The, the cost of LPG and natural gas in Europe, I think you've seen some of the numbers um, in Australia, they've doubled or trebled. Well, in some regions in Europe, you talk about five or 10 times increases. So there's a lot of interest in, in finding low cost, clean fuel gas. Let me, um, is my image up, Don, so you can just see the turbines behind me? Could people see? Uh, at the moment, we're seeing the slide Echo 2. Oh, the turbines, yes, where you are, yes. Yeah, yeah so you can see that, yeah. Yes. So, so let, so let me talk about optimal now. So why why is a oil and gas series engineers why why are they going to the Bio 360 conference? Firstly, um, Craig, so Craig and his team are oil and gas engineers. Um, Craig's a few years younger than me. They formed this company a bit over ten years ago. They're the capstone micro turbine agents, as I mentioned before. Um, and interested in using all sorts of different gases to um, for the micro turbine technology, which is quite proven technology now. But they're, but they're like-minded individuals that are also interested in um, helping all the things that Matthew Schmidt talked about. 
So Australia and the world has got both wet and dry residues that are currently undervalued and not utilised in the way that nature would utilise them. And so Craig and, and some of his shareholders have formed another part of the optimal group that they've called optimal, optimal renewable gas. And what they, what they are well underway of doing is um, developing anaerobic digestion based projects to pull in some of the liquid waste that come from some of the larger food producers in Northern Tasmania, um, various parts in Southern New South Wales, Northern Victoria and so on. So, so for Craig, the interest in Bio360 is there'll be a lot of anaerobic digestion technology there. There'll be a lot of people that he can talk to about the projects that, that Australia is, is well set up to um, um, start, start to develop. Um, those who've been in the biochar space for some time know there's, there's some good synergies between biochar and anaerobic digestion, whether the biochar goes in as part of the anaerobic digestion or whether the biochar is joined with the digestate at the end of the process, or in fact, if the digestate is paralyzed itself. So there's, there's lots of interesting um, circularities that, that we think will, will come out of the, this partnership that we've now got with Optimal. Um, I think that's all I want to say, Don. That, that, that's why they're there. I'm probably not representing them all that well, but that's... Um, anyway, the fact that they've got a hydrogen capstone engine that they're developing, I think, says a lot. Um, seeing gas is full of hydrogen. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Um, wonderful, wonderful presentation. So, yeah, bioenergy accounts for 47% of Australia's current renewable energy production and 3% of total energy consumption. Modelling for, uh, for, for the bioenergy roadmap uh, in 2020 shows that bioenergy has the potential to provide up 20% of Australia's total energy consumption by the 2050s. So, um, congratulations. If you'd like to make an appointment with Peter or Craig Dugan uh, from Optimal Group, please get in touch or go through the uh, Bio360 um, business meeting calendar. Thank you, Peter. Um, we'll move, we'll come, if you've got any questions for Peter, please put them in the, um, in the Q&A uh, panel and we'll come, come back to you at the end, Peter. So thanks a lot. Um, and then we'll move straight into our next presenter, uh, who is John Winter uh, from the CETA Group. Uh, John is involved with the development of uh, minerals benefit, benefication technologies, including high temperature fluid Bed, fluid bed roasting, calcination, agglomeration, coal gasification, and pyrohydrolysis. Uh, use of renewable and waste to energy has been of an interest for a number of years, which has led to development of fluid bed coffee roasting uh, using biofuels, hydrothermal upgrading process for used lubrication oils, ULO, coal fines, biomass for the production of biochar and clean syngas, and he operates a beef cattle property in Glen Innes. So welcome, John. I'll hand it over to you to run through your slides. Uh, thanks, Don. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so I've had an interesting background. I've grown up on a beef, sheep, cattle property, um, and farming property in northern New South Wales. So I've sort of always had a lot of links and um, for, back to agriculture, but I also had the opportunity to study chemical engineering in Newcastle. And of course, you know, 30 years ago, everything was about processing coal. So, but um, that has taught me a lot about pyro type processes over the years. And um, I then, was involved in looking at CO2 sequestration back about 2007, 2008, which was where I realized very quickly that it was going to be very difficult to take it from uh, coal-fired power stations and et cetera, and was where I got introduced to the concept of biochar. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so it's always been, uh, from that point forward, it's always been a subject of interest. And, I, and thanks, Peter, you've done a great job of, of setting the context for everything. I, I came to the same conclusion a long time ago that um, we needed some technologies that would scale up and produce clean syngas because making biochar on its own was not going to be 
uh, enough. So I'll just share my presentation. Um, hopefully everybody can see that. So luckily I've had quite a bit to do with handling syngas in the steel industry, particularly New Zealand steel. So I, I had a good understanding of the issues with syngas. Um, and so the technology um, we've been working on at CEDA, and I suppose I should introduce CEDA as well. So even the name stands for Sustainable Energy Agriculture Technology Australasia. Um, we've been around now for nearly 10 years, but um, and we've taken out, we've built a couple of pilot plants and done a lot of testing in the background and looked at a lot of different applications. Um, the focus of our talk for the conference is um, the hydrogen production and the beauty of producing a biochar in um, co-producing a biochar with that, of course, is you can be carbon negative. So I'll just start this. So I thought I'd virtually jump to the conclusion. Um, why, why bother with biohydrogen? And um, I think as it's been, been uh, mentioned, there's a heck of a lot of biomass that gets wasted in Australian agriculture. And I see also the ag sector being a part of the energy market in the future enables um, a lot, lot, lot more uh, inputs back into the land. So, you know, not just the people that have got wind turbines on their place or solar panels on their place, but anybody that can grow and sell biomass can be part of the energy market. And so, just to put it in context, I've used some common common fuels. Um, that's the cost that it would cost you at the moment to go and um, buy diesel, petrol, LPG. But the interesting point there is the biohydrogen, even with a biomass cost of over $150 a tonne, is significantly cheaper. And so, albeit there would be some retail costs onto that, there's a lot of room to move there. But of course, the big, the big difference to just making bio to making biohydrogen where you've got biochar is all of these all of the other technologies like uh, wind and solar and all the all the various other things can be carbon neutral, but they can't be carbon negative. And I think uh, this diagram shows it very clearly that uh, yeah you can have your cake and eat it too. So you can have your hydrogen fuel, and then you can also be carbon negative. Of course, the focus of this is on hydrogen, but like Peter just mentioned, syngas is a very useful gas for synthesis of a number of other chemicals. And the important, one of the important factors of that from an engineering point of view and scale point of view is ensuring that it contains the minimum amount of nitrogen. And that's what I'll, I'll continue to talk about. So um, although Craig Bagnall's listening, uh, I'm presenting just the front end technology part of it. Um, and, and then that's as far as I'm going today. And I'm just going to give you the key points around our technology. This photo off to the right hand side is a photo of both of our pilot plants. The one in the distance is the original uh, vertical reactor, sorry, horizontal reactor. And the one uh, to the right is the vertical reactor. So we're somewhere around, the, the original one was about 200 kilograms an hour. The next one was 500 kilograms an hour. And we're, we're hopeful to go up to about five ton an hour as our next 10 to one scale up. I'm going to start this conversation about air. Um, I, I'm pretty sure everybody here will realize that there's air only really contains about 21% oxygen, but it's the other stuff in there that gives you the problem when you start making syngas. So I just wanted to highlight that as a beginning point. Um, and then I'll quickly run through just for background, uh, pyrolysis in the true, true sense of pyrolysis is indirectly heated. Um, so the air, whilst is air is used to generally generate the external heat from combustion of waste syngas. Um, there's the, the issue with standard pyrolysis is scale up really, um, because I mean the initial you know somebody's put put um, biomass in a drum and heated it up and made biochar and then they tried to make the drum bigger and bigger and bigger until the point where it doesn't make sense anymore. So you end up with multiple units. Gasification using partial combustion. So sometimes this gets muddied with pyrolysis, but wherever you've got 
uh, you know, direct heating with uh, combustion or, you know, of, of part of the syngas within the process. I'm sort of calling that a type of partial combustion. And the issue with that is you still end up diluting your uh, syngas with a lot of uh, nitrogen, whether you like it or not. Um, I'm saying the char is a little bit lower quality there, but not necessarily. It depends on what the feedstock is. Um, and then the large commercial scale oxygen blown gasifiers have gone the next step and use air separation units, um, which at the scale they're operating at are cryogenic units. So use enormous amount of power to, um, to compress, compress air, liquefy it, separate the nitrogen, which I might remind you from the previous one, you're throwing away 78% or more of what you've compressed. So it's a lot of energy goes into that for not a lot of good. And then once you put pure oxygen into these reactors, the temperature would be too high. So then you have to provide steam as the mediator to control the temperature. Um, and I suppose the other highlight from that is there is no remaining carbon because these, these uh, units operating at sort of plus 1500 degrees Celsius. So that just gives you a bit of an idea, and I've jumped the gun on this slide. So there's there's really the issues with um, pyrolysis is you've got low yield to syngas because you're making a lot of tars and oils. Those tars and oils also tend to have operational issues with condensing. Um, so it's it's a, it's an engineering issue quite often that if you're operating at say 500 degrees, the moment you get it to 499, you start condensing some parts of those gases onto surfaces, and there's just no way around that. Um, and of course, you know, if you've got on the gasification, if you've got high dilution with nitrogen, um, you've got to compress all of that syngas to do separation, typically PSA at smaller scale. So you're compressing, again, you're compressing nitrogen for no real reason. Um, and then the the commercial oxygen blown units tend to be, you know, plus billion dollar type capex. They're massive, and so they're really only aimed at, you know, sitting on top of a coal resource um, and being big unit, big big units, because that's the only way you can make them cost effective is to make the scale very very big. So it doesn't really make sense in the in what we want to do with generating regional industry and and taking residues from a number of uh agricultural operations and things so and I, I suppose the also the part that a lot of people don't realize is you know you've gone all this effort to separate out 21 percent of the oxygen to then join it with the carbon to then compress all of that to then put that down a hole um so you've actually added 72 percent extra mass to what you want to get rid of so this is the point about biochar. It's so good being a solid form of, you know, let's say 75 to 80% carbon that has lots of other benefits and uses. And I think that's really something that's incredible about biochar. So introducing what, 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 what we've done differently, we've taken advantage of chemical looping technologies, but we sort of added a thermal looping part to it. So the thermal looping part really relates to pyrolysis. So we can operate at around, you know, five, 600 degrees C. And that's what allows us to produce uh, a biochar. Um, and but the, the next part about taking that off gas from the pyrolysis section, we can continue to heat that up uh, and go into a gasification phase. Now, gasification in this context is taking just simply those oils and tars. So it's really just the gas phase and further decomposing those. This is very similar to what's called fluid bed catalytic cracking, which is used to, to break down the heavy residual uh, oils in the oil industry and make gasoline and other things. So, so again, uh, like a lot of, lot of us in this industry, we're using fairly well-known unit operations and putting them together in a way that makes sense for our industry. So, it's sort of, uh, again, we've got the best of both worlds. I can control the amount of, um, pyrolysis that occurs and therefore the uh, biochar that's produced uh, and then I could also independently condition that gas so that I don't have other byproducts to get rid of or other things to deal with um, and I'd put this little chart here just to sort of highlight the temperature effect so by operating at different temperatures you get different quantity yields to biochar but of course the inverse of these curves is yield to syngas 
Um, and the other point here is, of course, crop residue, which most people think, oh, why would you bother using that? It actually contains a lot of syngas. So um, it's good to see Peter's using straw as well in the next scale up. Um, and it is quite a ready, ready or annual, annual um, source of biomass. The other, the other interesting thing about all these annual crops, so you've got a lot of wheat, canola, sunflower, all of these things are, are on purpose left to dry in the sun um, before they're harvested. So the moisture content is low um, and they're tra trashy, trashy type plants like that are really difficult to replant into. So typically, yes, they are burnt to get rid of them. Um, but by collecting that energy, and that's a lot of good energy, um, it can be harnessed. I just put this in by way of example, a uh, five tonne hour plant, you could be producing somewhere around 10 tonne an hour of, uh, a 10 tonne a day of, of hydrogen via PSA at about 80% recovery from your PSA. Uh, PSA stands for pressure swing absorption. The, you're around about 19 tonnes per day of biochar. Um, and then talking about carbon dioxide equivalent down per year, you're somewhere around 20,000 tonnes. So it doesn't take a real big plant to make some significant drawdown. And in fact, that would be about three truckloads of hay. That truck is one uh, that we use from Narrowbride. It can, can carry about 40 odd tonne of hay in per load. So, and of course, some of the other projects I've recently been working on is Prickly Acacia in Northern, Queens, uh, Northern Queensland, up around Richmond district. And it, it really is amazing how much is up there. And it is a very good biomass source. And this is a photo that I took that's near the Flinders River. Um, that area is going about 40 tonnes to the hectare biomass dry weight. Um, although it's not all like that, they, the estimates is there's about um, 22 million hectares that are infested. So that's nearly, that's close to the size of Victoria that's infested up there. And of course, the, the beauty of biomass is it can be stored. So can syngas, syngas can be stored, it can be utilized at various times um, and uh, allow energy on demand. So I, I see the bio industry really dovetailing very well into the renewable power sector at a lot lower cost and a lot lower impact than say pumped hydro, for example. And so, and then of course, all of these areas, particularly in North Queensland, would, would benefit from regrowing, strategically regrowing uh, biomass, particularly in a uh, like a, a cropping scenario where you had grasses growing in between rows of trees. And so there's a lot of potential for the future. Um, I suppose one quick note on the scale. So we use uh, a solid media as our heat transfer. And I just put this in to, um, highlight the benefit of a solid media for heat transfer. And this is assuming no pressure change. So therefore I can't generate high temperature steam and no change, phase change, so like steam. But you sort of see air is very low, um, or water is okay. So this is, I can only heat it between say naught and hundred degrees. If there's no pressure, you've got heating oils, you can get up to about 400 degrees C. But sand, you can heat that to a thousand degrees C. And so per volume, uh, energy per volume, you can get up to nearly 2.9 gigajoules per meter cubed. And so then that is what it allows us to scale up our units. So we get very high rates. So it's sort of a process intensity uh, discussion. And then modular versus scalable. This is a classic, you know, uh, capacity to the power of 0.7 rule. So of course, if you've just got modules, you've got a little bit of saving, but not great. Uh, whereas if you can continue to increase the diameter of your reactors and get more throughput through a single reactor, you tend to have less operational issues um, and the cost comes down. So I will say that, you know, we struggle, our technology struggles at the lower end, uh, but we really kick in when we get up to around the sort of five ton per hour and upwards, um, which is still not that big of a plant. Um, I was just going to touch on, on this diagram because it intrigues me. Um, the curling diagram sort of shows this wobble in it, which is a seasonal wobble, and it really shows the power of photosynthesis and the power of uh, plant growth in the sense that you're looking at about, you know, let's say six ppm change in total atmospheric CO2 every year, year on year. So if we can just chop that curve off, stop it going back up, 
um, and take some of that biomass and turn it into a, a recalcitrant form of carbon, biochar, we will have an effect on it. Um, so uh, that's the finish of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks very much, John. Um, so, um, yeah, hydrogen with benefits. Yeah. Um, bio uh, hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is very much the uh, flavor of the month with the government, isn't it? And uh, we can produce this from our residues. We can apply stewardship, produce green hydrogen, and then, of course, biochar to make it uh, carbon negative. So, congratulations. Mm -hmm on the work that uh, you, Craig, uh, Bagnell, and all of your team are doing um, to bring this technology to the world. And if you'd like to uh, meet up to discuss the technology further with John or Craig, um, they'll be uh, on our stall, uh, stand F36, the Ansbig Pavilion at Bio360, um, or uh, pre-book an appointment with them um, through business meetings at Bio360 website. Um, also, if you've got any questions for John, we'll come to you at the end. We are running uh, over time um, by about 30 minutes, actually. So um, if you need to go, there will be a recording sent out afterwards. And uh, also, we will share the, uh, all these slides with you um, after. So uh, next up, um, we have Joseph Cook. Uh, who is the Managing Director of Waste Ecology. So Joseph, if you would like to now turn on your, your video and audio settings, and you can share your screen if you'd like. And uh, Joseph completed his Bachelor um, of Civil Engineering at New South Wales um, in 1998. His academic uh, strengths are in the areas of structural analysis, structural design, hydraulic geotechnical investigation and construction management. Uh, the subject of his thesis was to develop a simplified equation, which predicts the time dependent deflection of rectangular reinforced con concrete slabs. His current project since 2022 is on working and developing uh, the organic car carbonization system, uh, OCS, which converts any kind of organic matter to a byproduct solid carbon and water. Joseph is the project director and is uh, ra raising working capital of 300 million. So over to you, Joseph, uh, to share your slides. Um, thanks, Don. And everyone will wonder why actually um, civil and structural engineering doing actually in the biochar world and the waste and the mechanical world and some other engineering disciplines. Since I have um, construction and development and structural experience, um, we experienced so much problem and construction and demolition waste where uh, actually the waste become pandemics and so much of um, you can't take it anyway. Um, and then that's what the concept of uh, OCS come up. It's about 2017, earlier than um, uh, uh, 2020 when OCS West Ecology was founded to come up with the system which to solve uh, the waste issue, which is the dilemma and predicament of all type of waste, not only in Australia's issue, but also international issues, uh, which dispose of all the environmental damages and health problem that causes, especially to those people who live next to the landfill and treatment plants. Um, why sarcology? Actually, it's as you know, it stands for organic carbonization system, uh, which can develop and produce any or convert any kind of organic waste and synthetic waste um, to biochar or syncha, what we call it syncha. Um, uh, as you know, like there is um, a huge volume of waste, which is um, at the moment treated um, whether uh, by conventional methodology or um, thermal methodology or um, non-conventional methodology. Um, and then just as a little bit of feedback, we know that's currently the global environmental issues and the impact which causes by the environmental uh, challenge, which causes the food shortage, air pollutions, 
um, potential of increases in the sea levels um, and the drought issue which facing the population and the growing and exponential growth of the population on this planet. Um, when we start the applications, uh, we considered to see like the volume and the emissions issue in Australia. And this is the diagram was taken from climatecancel.org.au, which shows the percentage of each sector and how much is contributing towards the global emission. Here we have a, um, a table to um, show us the figures which is definitely in million of ton. For the waste, which goes to landfill, recycling, energy recovery, export, which has been, I believe, has been banned since last year, and other waste. Um, moving forward uh, and starting the OCS, so we need to understand what is the OCS. So OCS is organic carbonization system. As I said, it's new to the market. It's not uh, exactly pyrolysis. What set us apart from pyrolysis is we don't have combustion and we don't produce seen gases. Um, primarily, we only produce biochar and nothing else. According to the environmental report, which we um, uh, carry out for the testing, which we did, um, the report did not detect or shows any kind of um, uh, emissions or um, seen gas productions. Um, the system works at uh, probably half the energy consumption for pyrolysis. It's somewhere between 350 to 450 with um, pressure and a catalytic, catalytic um, agency, uh, agents, which we use it to expedite the um, conversion rates. Um, the time for convert any kind of batch, it's ranging from five to 10 minutes, depend on the feedstock. Um, and the um, that's that's the design. This is that, that's we shown the our semi commercial reactor um, with the engineers at our waste at our warehouse at, in Sydney. So as I said, um, the waste we can treat any biomass or any plus any non biomass waste. Biomass, which include um, any municipal and solid waste, sewage, sludge, uh, animal, marines, life, um, any kind of waste generated from biomass. Uh, the non-biomass waste, such as heavy car tires, um, uh, heavy, pl sorry, heavy plastic industry, such as car tires or PVC items or PVC plastic soft um uh, no, soft plastic packaging materials um also also will be treated through the lcs and we can produce biocarbon or biochar and carbon what we call it uh lcs char or syn char um that's the type of food we produce the the analytical result from the laboratory shows that the biochar we produce it does um, exhibit very high uh, modular ratio. We are falling somewhere there, which is according to ABI classifications, uh, the life and the stability for our biochar, it's greater than 1,000 years. And we have this figures here, which is LC ratio 0 0.1 and HC ratio less than 0 0.01. This is the academic um, uh, testing result from EAL or Southern Cross University, which shows um, some of the chemical and the physical property of the biochar we produce. Uh, and according to CSRIO, um, and we had great discussion with the leading research uh, scientists there, they were very um, astonished with the result and the comment was well, that they never seen such a good result um, for the biochar before, which could be used for so many different applications. All these figures um, that are well below the EPA threshold. And um, of course, it's according to Australian standard. 
the applications of the carbon of the OCS char, it could be used for so many different applications. Just to keep it short, um, uh, it, it could be used for soil enhancement and amendment, animal feedstock, carbon sequestrations. Um, here, like I like to mention, that's um, the yield, our yield factor. And I did hear the previous colleague actually talking about the yield. Uh, we quite have very high yield um, for biomass yield. Um, the range of percentage conversion, it's somewhere between 65 to 75%. Um, for non-biomass, uh, we got between 65 to 90% um, conversion rate. So our production rate is quite very high for biochar. Um, our production capacity, it's uh, um, 50 ton per units, which um, just, which show in this um, diagram, it's been completed and due to be completed, um, or actually it's due to be started commercial reactor sometime in March, 2023. Um, we didn't design single reactor, to take the volume we needed, but each of the single reactor can convert about 50 ton per day of cross waste. Um, one set of OCS reactor, which is include the three reactors together. Um, when this is the design we, at the moment, put it into commercial, um, can do 150 ton a day. Of course, it could be increased by the demand by adding multiple reactors. Um, why single reactors and not what single reactor, of course, has so much um, of economical um, and visibility issue and logistic issue, which could be addressed later. Just if we go back to um, the PowerPoint presentation, sorry. Um, so this is the applications. Um, the benefit of, of, of the OCS it's um, the cost to revenue ratio is quite very high. Um, it could be installed in, uh, in, 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 in many places. A potential to scale up, also we have potential to scale down, um, which is make the OCS reactor more suitable for tanky solution for large development uh, complex, such as if we have a couple of hundred units or more than hundred units, and we need to put a reactor there to provide a tanky solutions um, to the residents, um, that will be ideal. That's of course, if there is a slash and allow that um, and have all the waste on site treated, all the water and sludge on site treated and converted to valuable biochar and then use it, um, the byproduct, whatever need to be used or applied to. Um, this as a summary, uh, we believe, and that's where actually the concept of OCS chart came through. That's the OCS chart. Um, it's an addition conventional methodology to convert um, organic waste or non-biomass waste to biochar with minimal uh, emissions. Um, as I said, this was no detection for any carbon dioxide or methane or any other scenic gas in our um, uh, reactor. Um, of course, it uh, will provide for um, uh, negative carbon and also can contribute towards the carbon sequestrations since we have very high conversion rate for um, both biomass and non-biomass um, conversion. The LCS reactor is ready to be installed in um, confined space or large space. Uh, as I mentioned, um, the commercial reactor, which we just used here for 150 ton, all we need for the reactor only 15 meters by um, nine meters, just to install the three reactors. That's probably about 235 square meters. And we have to add the feedstock preparations um, in addition to that, probably like another 500 square meters. So the total space needed for commercial size reactor, it's about um, 1,000 square meters, um, and the small foot reactor, uh, about probably 16 square meters. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, and if you have any questions, I will take it. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, 
so yeah, speeding up um, the production uh, of coal, I guess, underground. <laughs> yeah, it's we're true. doing it on, above ground. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. So well, um, let me share this yeah. one with you. Um, not uh, Don. This is mm. this diagram. I just started to mention yep. it to you, the bio chart. This yep. um, diagram which shows um, that's the modular ratio. It has a limits. If it's zero point two, it will do gra graphites, yep. or it's less than 0 0.6 according to IBI um, classification. It will give a charcoal. Yep. If it's gray, that's still an origin format of biomass. Basically, according to the graph which presented, we are somewhere here. So basically, in the graphite regions, and um, we have that's that's will make the biochar OCS biochar or biochar yep. we produce by OCS has very very high um, weather instability. Um, and then it lasts more than 1500 years and the environment before start to disintegrate. Right. Uh, of course, with high nutrient level. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, so yeah, um, closing the loop. So yeah, thank you so much for a great presentation, Joseph. And if you'd like to um, book an appointment with Joseph in Nantes next week, um, please get in touch uh, through the Bio360 website or uh, they can email you directly, uh, Joseph. Yes, um, yes, you can talk. visit us at uh, yep. uh, www.wisecircology.com yep. or your, send email yep. jturk at wisecircology.com. Yep. And your website is going, new website is going live today. So that's, today, that's, that's correct. Nice today. Yeah. So, look, thank you again. And uh, if you could okay. come share the screen now, Joseph, and we'll bring all of our presenters on. Um, I will. So I understand we've got Craig Bagnall, um, who's at the airport, ready to go to Nantes. Uh, so Craig, if you can hear if you and turn your screen on, you're welcome to join or just uh, speak when, um, when you can. And uh, the first question is to Nigel. Uh, Nigel, if you're still there, um, uh, we have gone over time. But Sajana, uh, Sajana Adhikari, you might remember, um, won our uh, student prize at the National Biochar Awards and she said uh, it's nice to hear about the demonstration site in Melbourne uh, just wanted to confirm does it process two tons an hour is this question for me that's for Nigel uh, uh, we do yeah. we do 50 ton gross waste okay. per day that would sorry, make it two and a half tons per hour yeah okay yeah sorry Joseph that was for Nigel sorry yeah our, our site at Listerfield, Don, will start at 500 kilos per hour, but okay. we're hoping that we'll be able to increase production, um, you know, to one tonne or maybe even two tonne as we move forward. Okay, great. Wonderful. All right. Um, now, Tom Miles is in the audience or was in the audience. Uh, so we've got a question here. What is the projected cost benefit of the 120 ton per day system so and the capex so i think tom might be referring to i'm not sure who tom's referring to there um but please speak up i think it was for john, john yeah john? yep yep uh, john? Hey. hey tom look forward to catching up with you in, in not but um the um the cost for the actual pyrolysis unit there would be in the order of you know on a greenfield site around sort of 12 million um but then uh that and then and that includes some syngas cleanup so and then including psa you're looking at around probably 20 million as a project there um but i suppose most of your hydrogen you're selling for it you'd be you, your sale price for hydrogen i would suggest would be somewhere close to three to four thousand dollars a ton so you're looking at thirty forty thousand dollars per day income from just the hydrogen and that doesn't include carbon credits or sale of the biochar so you could probably probably uh increase that to about sixty odd thousand dollars a day income from a plant like that right okay wonderful and and he's also asked how is the gas clean enough for psa has this been demonstrated uh it's not directly out of the unit, but uh, we certainly remove all the residual tars and oils. We still go through a compression phase and a uh, refrigerator dryer to get moisture out because moisture is the biggest issue in a PSA. 
Um, and then there are, and luckily biomass being low in sulfur, you don't have to worry too much about sulfur. So there's a couple of guard beds there for acid gases. So we do a wet scrub and then we do a compression drying, go through some guard bed material and then uh, to the PSA. And of course, one of the advantages of hydrogen through a PSA, your product gas remains at pressure. So it's, it's um, useful from that point of view. Uh, yep. even though you would have to pressurize it further to cylinder pressure, but it's it's a good start. Okay, great. And this question, um, you know, could be answered by, by anyone, um, but, you know, um, maybe Nigel, you could start, but what sort of car soil carbon increases to depth are possible with biochar? Nigel or anyone else? Yep. Craig, that's a good one for you. Craig. I think. Craig. <laughs> There, probably, Craig. Yeah, can you guys hear me all right? Yes, yes. I apologize if you hear any kind of funny beepers, you know what airports are like, so hopefully it's all right here. Um, yeah, with soil carbon, um, we can see it depends obviously on where you're starting from. If you're in a, a poor soil or a, or a good soil, but um, Doug Powell's work over there in WA has been accelerated by actually mixing in. Um, biochar into a system where they're also using dung beetles to bury it to depth. So soil carbon can be significantly increased by um, using it in a system approach. Um, in that case there, where they're feeding it to cows, dung beetles then taking the carbon that's coming through and burying it to depth. And there's a, we've seen a very big increase in there. So they've seen, I think he went to 8% from two or 3% on his farm in, in a very, very short period, a, number, a, couple, a couple of years, I think it was. But um, John, this is probably a question too. I know John, John's very passionate about soil carbon. He's a farmer himself. He's a fifth generation farmer in New South Wales. John, you'd probably be a perfect person to answer that too on other soils, well. Yeah, well, I think some of the numbers that, that have come from DPI work has talked about, you know, an increase of three times whatever you put in over a 10 year period. That of course is affected by weather conditions, but um, yeah, so any any little bit helps. And I guess that's the whole message with biochar. We want to make it a habit. And so people just keep doing it and keep adding to it. And it keeps multiplying via the label carbon systems. So so therefore, um, yeah, you can end up with very high carbon to, to one metre depth if you've got that biological activity happening in your soil. Yes, yes. And I guess... As, as uh, others have mentioned earlier on too, including Matthew, um, this whole idea about reversing the, the degradation of soils and, and desertification, where you start turbocharging these other um, mechanisms and, and these other negative emissions technology uh, methods that are the natural methods that are recognized by the FCC. Yeah. And particularly yeah. if we can get, um, as uh, Stephen's always saying, getting those um, the bacterial and the fungi systems in particular um, because of providing the, the home with the moisture and the nutrients being held there for those things to proliferate. And they're not just linear, of course. So they start to see very big increases as they did with Doug's, Doug's work over there in his avocado or just with their rows where some of that stuff started to really uh, accelerate yeah. uh, much more than just what you put in to start off with. So there's all that negative That's priming not, effect that yeah. um, they talk about. Yes. And Stephen's uh, big on uh, basalt based both pre-treatment and post-treatment with basalt um, type biochars, which are, of course, that's the enhanced weathering uh, method um, mentioned by the IPCC as well. So it's very exciting and we can now start to apply uh, liquid biochars. So, um, you know, we can cover these really uh, large broad acre agriculture uh, type projects reforestation, whatever it is. So um, Tom Miles has said, very nice, clear presentation, John, many thanks. So a thumbs up from Tom Miles, it's a big thumbs up. And uh, uh, Errol Smith, um, to Joseph, uh, how much energy, extra energy input is needed or is it entirely autothermal, including electrical inputs? Um, Joseph? Um we need the uh, when the reactor start up probably need about 750 kilowatt but after six hours when it's warm up and ready to convert to waste 
it will reduce the heat uh, um, consumptions to about half the, probably about 350 kilowatt or something. We're running the LCS for the first time for three months uh, and the end of February when I come back from France. Um, and then we believe that's uh, the system itself, it will probably, it will reduce more than half um, as long as the reactor have continuous um, running 24 hours, seven day a week. And it will run for 360 days. But we give it one week maintenance per year. Wonderful. All right. Um, so look, uh, we might uh, we might wrap things up uh, there with our Q and A. Um, Alvin Lee at Puro Earth has just made a comment: application of both biochar as well as silicate rocks onto broadacre, termed enhanced weathering in the Puro standard, can provide joint effects to the soil and area right. For further research. So, um, Don, yeah. can I say comments? Yeah. Um, yes. Surprise! It's not. Um, it's not a marketing issue, but just to let you know, that's um, uh, we we do everything like an experiment here, and uh, like three four months ago, um, I was asked by CSRI uh, uh, scientists just to do a little experience, and um, in the garden for plantations, and I planted tomato. So I put one pellet of biochar converted, which is the food stock was um, compost into a cup of water. Within two seconds, actually it sank to the bottom of the cup and within four days, for some reason, it's absorbed all the water in, in, in the cup. Um, I planted the tomato and then I applied biochar from the compost food stock. And at the moment it's the, uh, about two and a half, three meters high. So I have to have a ladder just to keep tight on the top of it. And then the bottom of it, it's continuously wet. Just continuously wet. So yes, yes, the wonderful benefits of the biochar. Thank you, Joseph. Um, oh, Joseph, you, you don't mind um, unsharing your screen now. Uh, sorry. And, then, and we'll just uh, wind up. Is there any other comments, closing comments from any of our presenters today before we close? Any other comments from anyone? No. Well, thank you. Thank you again to all our presenters uh, today. And uh, once again, if you would like to pre-book a meeting at Bio360, go to the business meetings calendar and book an appointment there or get in touch uh, with Anspeak and or, or the presenters directly. We will send out a recording and the slides uh, thereafter. Um, so if you uh, are not attending, um, but would like to inquire further, you know, please get in touch. So thank you um, to all our uh, participants out there. And uh, we'll look forward to catching up with you next week in, in Nantes at Bio360 Expo. So until then, ciao. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank <clears throat>